So I'm going to talk to you a bit about what I've been into the last two or three years. Um, I've gotten this weird hobby of doing hardware games, which are kind of hard to, to sell and, uh, you know, do anything with. But um, let's do this structured. So that's me. I'm uh, living in London, but I'm actually from Germany. I don't know how long I'm going to stay there, you know, like Brexit and all. It's kind of going to go away. That's why I'm here for 10 days now. I'm going to check out other indie scenes to see where it's actually nice to live. And the weather is also crap, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I just a fairly standard background. I made mobile games for a while, and then now into experimental hardware games, um, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so I'm just going to go quick overviews, like why now, who's making them, where they played, uh, who's playing them, and I give you an example of uh, Line Mobler, which is uh, a game I built. Actually, how many of you have not heard of Line Mobler? Okay. Um, well, I'm asking questions. How many of you do know what an uh, do not know what an Arduino is? I guess slightly less. All right, that's good. I'm going to explain those things, um, and we'll start with why now. So, it's basically better in every aspect than ever before. So it's uh, easier to use. There's like some hardware out there which, which you can make games which don't require any programming whatsoever. So for example, there's the Makey Makey, which acts as a keyboard, basically. So you plug it in, and it's a keyboard, but you can hook it up to a banana, and suddenly your banana is like left, and then the orange is right. And you know, you can, you can use anything you want, just like uh, physical touch is enough to, to trigger those. Um, there's little bits, which I'm gonna explain in the next slide. Um, the, also, the hardware is getting way cheaper, so the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, which is like a full Linux computer with graphics card, uh, memory, everything is like just four dollars, which is ridiculous. It's like a tiny uh, little credit card size computer. It's like a gigahertz or something. Um, they're easy to buy. There's like more online shops than ever before. Uh, eBay is there, and the Chinese are copying everything, and you know, so it's half price <laughs> um, and half the quality usually. So it's kind of dodgy. Um, the hardware itself is getting better as well, so there is a specialist kind of kits for everything. So I'm going to talk about the Teensy in a bit, which is like a specific Arduino that I'm using. And also, like, there's a lot of Kickstarter devices that are uh, kind of tailor-made for certain purposes. So like audio processing kits that are like tiny things, or the Internet of Things um, is still around. And uh, there's like um, little chips for that that are connected to, to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, everything. And also the communities are better. So there's both offline communities, so hack spaces and maker spaces that are in all major cities. So in London, there's a, the London hack space that I'm always going to. And they have all the kind of hardware that you would need. So kind of laser cutters, 3D printers, wooden workshop. And they teach you everything as well. So I, know, I knew nothing coming in. So I had like a software background. And, uh, and um, there's also online communities. So uh, there's some big forums. And uh, these, uh, yeah, that's basically every question you could have has probably already been answered. So you can just Google for, I don't know, how do I connect an accelerometer to whatever my projector? I don't know. <laughs> and someone will have done this, and you can, you can shake projectors. <laughs> uh, there's also like uh, Thingiverse, where people put up 3D printed stuff, and so you can just download all kinds of things. You, know, you can download a car if you want. Um, also, who would do that, right? So this is like the, uh, the little bits. Um, so they're like super simple starter kits, basically. Um, they're super expensive, <laughs> but they're super simple. So you see they're color-coded as well. So blue is power, pink is input, and then green is output. So this is like a little thing where you push a button, and then a light comes on, and there's a little uh, vibration motor. Um, but obviously, you can make much bigger things than that, so you can hook up all kinds of things. So it's kind of really cool to get started with, a, with kind of minimal... Uh, experience and this is built for kids, but it's you know also cool to to make it yourself. And so this is like the uh, 
the Arduino that I mentioned, the TNZ, and so the Arduino is like a tiny computer that you hook up to your USB, and uh, you program it on the computer, which is a normal programming language, so it's uh, C++ or a variant of it, and then you uh, upload it, and it's running entirely on this tiny thing, so this is kind of, you know, half the size of a thumb. Um, but they're, they're super cool little computers, um, and so the TNZ, compared to the normal Arduino, is just better. It's like, it's, it's faster, um, it has more pins, so if you kind of uh, going from a basic stage to the next one, like saying, oh, I want to make a better thing, I want to make a thing that uh, can read five things at once, then you can use, and it's like hardware for you, basically. And so I use them in my games, and they're, they're pretty good, they do everything I want, and kind of rave everywhere about those little chips. Um, yeah, so code. <laughs> it's only like a little example to see what, how like, it actually looks like to program an Arduino. Um, if you're not a programmer, don't worry, it's not necessary. Um, but like you can see, I don't know if I have a, no, oh, wait, I have a laser pointer, yes. Um, so you have to see if you have like two functions, like setup and loop, and like setup is called when you plug in power, and it's just called once, and then loop loops over and over and over and over until you switch it off or, you know, something breaks. Um, and so this is like a code to, to um, talk to an LED strip, an LED strip that has like different col colors for each pixel, and you can see them upstairs, uh, my game's using this code. Basically, so but it's a very simple code. Like you just add some LEDs, and then you say, okay, uh, the tenth LED should now be green. So this is red, green, and blue. And then you say show, and it shows. I mean, this code is fairly stupid, but um, you can see like with like three lines of code, basically you can have it. And then there needs to be some setup. So you need to have this library, which kind of tells the uh, Arduino what an LED strip is, say how many LEDs you want, and to which pin you connected it. Right. So it's um, it's it's a Simple thing to do. And obviously, then it goes uh, more complex from there. Um, so once you build, um, no, first of all, like, who is making those games? So like, there's like, a lot of different people, and, but there's no kind of bigger companies, because there's like, basically no market for those games uh, as such, so no, no established market at least. So there is uh, a lot of people um, that are kind of like little niche programmers. A lot of them do it as a hobby, so I, I do it as a hobby pretty much as well, although now I'm doing it pretty much full time. Um, and I'm just, uh, there's like too many to mention, but I'm just going to go over a few of my, my idols and like big influences. So for example, this one is probably the most professional one. Um, it is called Beast of Balance, which just is coming out this year. Um, and it's made by some friends in London. And it's a, it's a kind of a little stacking game. It's a bit like uh, Jenga, but you build up and there's like a scale that is connected to an iPad. So you kind of, uh, the, the, the iPad knows which pieces you put up, and then it's kind of a little simulation going on. And this, is, this game is interesting because they did the full uh, process of kickstarting it, and then uh, traveling to China, finding a fa manufacturer, and getting it manufactured, and hopefully it's, in, uh, it's a physical box project in stores uh, before Christmas, so that's what they're hoping. Um, so that's kind of, they went the whole way, and it's, uh, it's quite daunting. Um, so I don't want to go this route. But I'm gonna, <laughs> but I'm gonna talk about like what you can do with them later as well. Um, this is Jerry. Um, he uh, was basically the first contact I got into the hardware game scene. He made this Chooseatron, which is like a, a printer adventure game. So, so you you have like these four buttons, and it's super cool. So like it, it starts printing, you know, the typical little um, receipt printer noise. Like, and it prints out like, oh yeah, there's a door in front of you. Do you want to go left? Do you want to go right? Do you want to punch the banana? And so you press punch the banana and then it keeps going and it has like a hundred stories. It's so cool. And then you can tear it off and take the story home with you. It's so nice. This one is also super cool and I haven't seen this around much. I saw it in Toronto. Um, it is basically, uh, so you see this is paper and you can draw on the paper with pens, but then it takes a photo of it um, analyzes where the, the, the markings are and makes a pinball game out of it. And it projects the pinball game right onto the paper. So um, you should really see it in action. So unfortunately, I didn't put a video in here. It's called Flip Paper. Um, and then the, the pinball will go around. And like, different colors mean different things. So green is like, uh, I think it's going to be a, a bouncy surface. Red is going to be like, a, like a, I don't know, button power up. I forgot that. But there's like you know, four colors and four different things. So that's super cool. Uh, different games, and there's uh, Dobotone, uh, which is kind of a four plus one arcade where um, four pl people play, and the fifth player is kind of messing with the game. So it's kind of <laughs> distorting the playing field, speeding it up, scaling it. It's very cool. Um, and there's obviously many more that I didn't mention, but uh, 
Second, some other names. I don't know, most of the people I know are actually from the European scene because I'm not he over here so much. Um, so I don't know if you even know most of those people that, you know, like if you go to a Maze Festival in, in Berlin, then uh, you'll, you'll probably meet all of them there. Super nice. Um, yeah, so where are those games made? So obviously, as it's so niche, there's no kind of big uh, corporate entity that makes these games. Well, I mean, I guess toys are there, so as that. But like as an indie game um, institution, there's a couple game jams, um, which I'm mentioning here. Um, so there's Zoom Machines Festival, which is a small festival in France. It's just been around for a couple of years, and that is always, it's like a normal game jam, but everyone's focusing on hardware games, and they're making like weird um, little experiments. I made a game there with um, a knife on a motor, so you have to kind of dodge the knife. Um, there's a picture of it in the end. It's very dangerous. <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, like, safety is not the first concern if you make a hardware game. It's like, <laughs> might be cool. <laughs> um, so it was good fun. No one has uh, kind of cut themselves badly enough to bleed out or something. So, so far so good. It's, it's more, it's more really more an accident because we used like a really cheap motor, so the motor wasn't strong enough to cut. But uh, you know, so these games are cool. And then there's also the old control game jam, which is connected to the old control uh, GDC exhibition, which I'm going to talk about in a minute as well. Um, this one is a bit weird because it's a hardware jam, but it's online only, um, so nobody gets to play any games. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you're supposed to upload a video of how the game works, and um, so it's, it's not quite the same, you know. Especially if your game has like really cool haptics, it doesn't quite come through. But it's a, it's a general, it's like a logistics issue, right? So if you make software like video games, you can upload them and play anywhere, but hardware is like very uh, locally limited. Um, obviously, you can also do it in normal game jams. I mean, this is kind of the weirdest normal game jam I know anyway. But it's a it's a train jam, so it's a game jam on a train. Uh, it's, it's the longest train ride in, um, at least in the US, I don't know, maybe Canada has a longer one, from Chicago to San Francisco for 52 hours. And uh, this always runs just before GDC, so I would recommend to everyone to do this game jam. I mean, it's a bit tricky because the tickets sell out in like in 30 seconds. <laughs> but this year, um, Adriel, who's organizing it, um, she booked the entire train. So it's like, this day you can't take this route anymore, it's like booked out. Which is... It's super cool, and then it's like just nerds on this train, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. You get very distracted because the, the countryside is so nice. So it's like going through the Sierra Nevada and Colorado River, and uh, it's very, very nice. I would highly recommend it. You get less work done, I guess, um, but you know, it's okay. Um, yeah, so my example is Line Wobbler, which is the game I have made and have been kind of touring around a little bit. And it's, it's a one-dimensional game. So it's a one-dimensional dungeon crawler running on an LED strip. So you see three of these games here. So like the, this game uh, starts here down here and it goes up and it, uh, it's fairly tall. It's like five meters long. And uh, you play on this strip, basically. You have a character and you can only go backwards and forwards because it's one-dimensional. And on the way, so you're trying to reach the other end of the strip and you kind of defeat enemies on the way. So it's kind of like you wobble the spring. So the, the controller I built is a, is a new, it's like a spring-based controller. So if you know these doorstopper springs, which go brrrr, that's exactly what the inspiration was. So it's like a little spring down here. And I'm going to talk more about the spring, actually, in particular, because it's, um, it's an interesting issue when you make hardware games, because with software games, you have software bugs, and with hardware games, you have software bugs and hardware bugs which is super annoying, or it can be quite difficult, because often these hardware problems don't appear right away, so it, it, there's wear, right? There's wear in the game, and they, they break down eventually, uh, or you know, quicker or slower, depending on how well you build it. And getting a game solid enough for, for, for an audience is actually like a really tough challenge. It's uh, super tricky. So this is when I showed this game in Rome at the Maker Fair. Um, so all these kids, uh, they speak only Italian, I speak only English, well, German as well, but that didn't help. <laughs> and so I had no way of communicating with those kids, and I couldn't tell them, oh, no, don't, don't pull so hard. <laughs> and um, so they were like really good stress testers for the game. The, the game survived, but uh, just barely. Um, so iterations through exhibition is, is kind of crucial, because you can't really test it uh, in the dry, so to say. So it gets, you need to get it out there, and then usually it breaks, so I have two backup copies of the game up, <laughs> up there, just in case. Um, 
But now I've got it more sturdy. And um, one of the reasons is because like, I went through all these iterations already. So the main one was the springs. So the first springs I used were these uh, shoe tree springs. And I don't know if you know them. They're fairly old-fashioned for leather shoes to, put the, you know, to keep them in shape overnight. So these are actually my grandma's. <laughs> and I, I made game controllers out of them. So you can see like, <laughs> up here, this is uh, a 3D printed. And there's like, a little sensor in here, like an acceleration sensor. And uh, the wire runs through the thing. And uh, these worked kind of okay, but it was kind of hard to get more, so my, my grandma only had four copies. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit hard to source those. And like when the, the, the current ones are all cheap, plasticky ones, and they don't really last very long. So afterwards, I decided to switch over to door stopper springs, which are, you can kind of see here on the side. They're much smaller, but much easier to use. You know, they're meant to be drilled into a surface, so that worked out well. Um, but it turns out they're too weak. So, like, especially when kids play it or drunk people, they don't care, right? <laughs> so they pull up and uh, basically destroy your, your game. Um, so I needed a, another solution. Um, so I needed a stronger spring. And it turns out there is a, a factory that makes uh, springs. Um, so I went to them and told them, hey, I want to make a game controller. And they, they, they go, what? <laughs> we make springs for doors and <laughs> cars. But they, they, they were, after a while, they kind of understood what was going on, and they, they built uh, springs for me, which is kind of cool. So I had 50 springs made here. It's not even that expensive, so I'm paying uh, like a, a $6 per spring now. It's uh, like if I would order way more, like a thousand, then it would go much less, but then I have a thousand springs, you know, so, <laughs> so it looks like this. <laughs> um, but those springs are much better. So now I know way too much about springs. You know, like there's the, the wobble factor, like the oscillation rate. It depends on the thickness of the overall uh, spring diameter and the diameter of the wire itself, right? So then you can experiment with that. And the next ones, I'm going to change it as well, like also on the length of, this, of the spring. So these ones, the ones I use are probably a bit too long. So like if you later play it upstairs, you can, you can feel it kind of goes wop, 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 wop. But uh, so use the technical term, right? <laughs> Um, but I want it to feel more closer to like a doorstop of spring, so it goes brrrr, so like a bit faster. Anyway, it's like a, it's a very kind of minor complaint, so it's like a very game feel thing. Yeah, so by now I know all about springs, so it's a kind of an odd mm -hmm. thing. Uh, laser cutting is super cool, uh, super easy if you have access to a laser cutter. They are super expensive, but um, usually like your makerspace has a laser cutter. And then uh, if you want to make a box, uh, it's super simple, there's like box maker um, tools, like websites even. You say like the diameter, like how big you want the box to be, uh, and how big your material is, and then it makes these kind of tapped uh, cutouts for you, which you can use straight away. And then you can kind of uh, use Illustrator. You can make little circles on it, and then it cuts out a circle. And then you have your box, and uh, it, it looks pretty cool. Uh, and these are, like, the, the, the usage costs are fairly cheap, so this would be about um, maybe three, four dollars, I guess. 3D printing, um, that's yeah, famous enough. Um, there's new materials as well now, so like there's soft materials. It's called NinjaFlex, which is kind of squeezable. So that's re really, really cool because uh, it allows you to make kind of joints, which kind of flex. And uh, also the, the knob I'm using uh, uses that, so you can feel it upstairs if you want to. And so that's what they look like in the end. Um, a couple of them, I, used, I experimented with different colors and uh, different types of wood. Um, yeah, and so once you have all these, and what do you do with them? So you can exhibit them. And I already mentioned the Alt Control GDC exhibition, so that's the kind of the biggest one, uh, or like the, the most famous one for alternative controllers. Um, it's part of GDC, the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. Um, so the next one is uh, late February next year. And the good thing is the deadline is only in five weeks, so you all should totally submit something. And uh, new this year, there is going to be an IGF award. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the most prestigious awards, I guess, for indie games. Um, and there's one for alternative controllers. So all the games that have been submitted are eligible, and you can win a, a cool prize. Or well, I don't know if there's a prize, and at least an award. <laughs> um, there's normal games exhibitions, so like if there's no hardware section in specific, you can just submit it anyway. It's a bit tricky sometimes to convince the, the, the curators to show your piece, because they can't usually play it in advance, because it's a hardware game. Um, but usually you'll find a way or another. So this was in Tokyo last month. That was actually really successful. And it turns out the Japanese are way better at games than any other exhibition I've shown in that. So I needed to crank up the difficulty. You know, they're all so used with their arcade games to, to fast movement. They, they knew what was going on. 
and there's also an interesting thing, Jeff, yeah, um, that the, the language actually is, uh, so they don't speak any English, so it's usually very difficult to talk to them, but there's a, a common video game language uh, between Japanese and English, because like for example, stage clear is never translated, so they always have stage clear. Uh, they also understood enemy and weapon, and so then I was, I was in the clear, so I can just say, you know, show them wobble an enemy, and then, yeah, it was all good. <laughs> But uh, I, I guess it's a bit of a, more of a problem if you have like a VR game that is super complicated. So I don't know uh, how much trouble Colin had with their game, but uh, you probably need a, a Japanese translation or um, someone who can help out. Um, there's a couple other ones, uh, other exhibitions. I'm not going to go into detail with them. Well, maybe it's like uh, a lot of them are uh, Europe-centric. Well, not actually a lot of them. So like EGX is in, in the UK. It's a Eurogamer Expo. Um, the, there's a left field collection which uh, shows specifically indie games and unfinished kind of experiments. And they actually also showed my knife games, so they, they don't really care about health and safety. <laughs> so the edgier, the better. So that's, that's a, a cool one to go to. Uh, Amaze Berlin is like, the, I think, the best indie festival in, in Europe. So if you get a chance to go, I would highly recommend it. Berlin is also super nice in spring. Uh, Thorsten, who runs Amaze, also does it in Johannesburg, um, but it's a bit harder to get to. Um, yeah. Indicate is cool. Uh, here's Amaze Berlin. It's like in an old factory building. Uh, you can also show it at like other festivals. So this is a music festival in Romania. Um, so often there's a big overlap between music festivals. Uh, if you have a light, like a light game or a rhythm game, that kind of works super well usually. I showed it at Burning Man. That was cool. <laughs> Turns out people on drugs really like uh, moving LEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's also like a really harsh environment. You know, the sand is like super, uh, super uh, acidic. Uh, no, basic, the, the opposite. So like it's, it kind of basically rusts everything away. And so it's like the hardware is going to probably need to replace it afterwards. Um, yeah, so there's a couple other non necessarily like video gamey sites. So there's like a lot of museums that focus on games, and they often are more open to experimental stuff, like Game Science Center in Berlin especially, sh has shown my games since day one, and they keep breaking, and uh, they're very uh, patient, luckily. Uh, Maker Fairs are cool places, and then there's like these festivals I mentioned. There's also light festivals, like Fit de Lumiere. Yeah. So, um, if you... Then the question is also, like, once you have a game, if you want to make more out of it, what can you do? Because there's no marketplace as such, so it's a bit tricky to figure out what to do. Um, and like, I think there's like three options, more or less. So either you keep it small scale and you have it like as installation art, um, so like a, maybe just a single piece, you know, if it's very hard to make more of them. I don't know if you know uh, VEC9, it's a kind of a cool vector art arcade machine, but they actually use a real tank controller, like a, like a, like a you know, war tank. So they have a Russian-made, um, looks like a gamepad, but it's like super, it's like uh, full metal. It's like super heavy and chunky. It feels so nice. But obviously they are hard to source, so there's only one, I think, in, in existence. <laughs> uh, yeah, then you can also kickstart and do mass production. Um, and I've showed it at the, um, there's like the Beast of Balance did that. There's a lot of work involved in there. Um, Kickstarters anyway, like all my friends who did Kickstarters say it's, it's a nightmare. Like, first of all, you need to kind of spend you know, probably months preparing the, your, your campaign, and then you need to spam the press, spam your friends, everyone hates you in the end, you're totally drained, and then maybe you don't make the goal anyway. <laughs> so it's a bit tricky, especially with hardware games, because people, you can't really try them before. And uh, with Line Wobbler, it's also tricky, um, because it doesn't show very well on photos, so it looks like a, some weird random LED strip in a spring and it doesn't look at the cool game that I think it is, and you can, you can try it upstairs. And um, so it's very difficult to, to do that step. And then mass production anyway, it's like you have to find a factory in China, you have to find the second factory that doesn't try to rip you off, <laughs> you have to find lawyers probably, and uh, it's, it's not things I'm interested in. If you have a business partner, maybe, right? And you can also license it out. So um, there are uh, toy companies, so Hasbro, for example, is always looking for inventors. Um, and I've briefly talked to them, but not too much, um, because mostly they're interested in uh, their own IP that they have. So, like, if you can make a Spider-Man <laughs> game out of it, then it's cool. But if it's, like, your own weird abstract thing, they, they're not quite that interested, I think. Um, there's also arcades, so, like, arcade manufacturers. That's much less of a thing now here in the West. 
They're still big in, uh, in Japan, uh, but although I think that the market is also a bit in trouble, struggling. And uh, yeah, I've, I've talked actually to um, a few of them, so that's, they're kind of interested in to, to, to get new games um, as well. But it's very tricky to talk to Japanese companies. You never know if it's going well or not. They, you know, they, it's, a, it's a different business mentality. Um, yeah, oh, this is the knife game I mentioned. <laughs> so you see, so the, there's actually a motor here. And it's a, it's a cooperative game. So you, the knife moves around and you kind of jump the blade with your finger. Uh, and the first level is called All Nice. <laughs> but then later on it gets like erratic and it goes back and forth. <laughs> and it, it's also, uh, it's touch sensitive, um, so if I notice that uh, a player touches it, it goes chick, 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 chick. <laughs> yeah, you have to commit. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, the cutting edge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, are we out of time? That's my talk. Thanks.